My talk is about being by local, connecting Vilnius to Vancouver and vice versa. I was born in Vilnius, but I've lived in Vancouver for about 25 years. So both places I can call home, which makes me a by local in a way. And by local, by definition, means that you can inhabit two places. It is easy to live in Vancouver, to set roots there, because the city in reality is relatively new. City, but not the place, and that's important to remember. Because the city is about 150 years old, so living there for about 20, 25 years, you feel that you are making a substantial part and going somewhere in, in the history of the city. So in Vilnius, it's completely different. The city is about 700 years old, so living, spending only 20 years or less in the city makes you like very, very feels insignificant part of the city. Now, I always think about Vancouver as a very global city, very open city. In a way, it is a growing city. It is, it is a city that where everybody comes to live, and I think it's by all kinds of measure, it's one of the best cities in the world. Vilnius, on the other hand, it's a very local place. And here, where its history matters. So if you think about how to put two things together, global and local, think about how we can put together history on a global scale. So my talk is going to be about me being by local and what can offer for everyone to experience and to see your own home and foreign places with a different point of view. The concept of bilocation has its origin in mysticism, even from ancient Greece. Pythagoras was one of the sort of originators, if you want to call, of bilocality. The important aspect of bilocal is not that you're splitting yourself in two parts, you're not an amoeba or something like that, but actually that you've been witnessed by somebody else of being in two places at the same time. So in the way, you don't have to travel, it's just you have to be witness. My favorite is actually is the so-called flying saints, and this is in the Christian tradition, where you can like, be miraculously appearing to different places. This notion of bilocality, as you can see, even travels to some kind of a more secular ideology. Bilocation means that you can inhabit two places or choose where you want to live without any pressure. So the best example is a married couple, and, it does, and can choose to live with each part of in-laws, whatever what your husbands or wives or other partners. Now, there are very few societies that are truly by local by definition in many ways, because most of the societies put pressure where new are supposed to live. So by local societies actually have less stress, and they're prone less to violence, and also they're less warlike. And I like that idea. I like the idea that being by local and being able to choose, you can be perhaps experience world as a much more peaceful place. Now, to me, and I think to everyone, the concept of bilocality and by being bilocal involves a certain form of estrangement. So for instance, when somebody asks me in Vancouver where I'm from, I can say that I'm from Vilnius. So I create a distance. Similar fashion when somebody can ask me in Vilnius where I'm from, I can say from Vancouver. Also creates a distance. So I always bring a perspective Finding your own home as a little bit, a little bit, and that's important to remember, a strange place, an unfamiliar place. Now, when I left Lithuania, I left Lithuania in the late 1980s uh, with the Soviet passport. You can see the Soviet passport, a red passport. <laughs> uh, and for some strange reasons, never told me why, uh, in my passport, it was, my last name was misspelled, and the Soviet passports were written, printed in Russian, and then in French, in Latin, so Cyrillic and Latin letters. But my name was misspelled, and I lost my I, my letter I. I felt like very much insulted because I thought that is an important letter. <laughs> so I left Vilnius, actually. I couldn't replace my passport. I left Vilnius without my I. The Soviets robbed me of my eye. <laughs> as soon as I reached West, I approached Lithuanian Embassy. The Lithuanian Embassy was the only place 
uh, in Rome, and I think in Washington DC, but in Rome next to the Holy See, where Lithuanian representation from pre-war Lithuania still existed. And they were issuing passports of Lithuanian, as you can see. Now, this passport allowed me to travel around the world, and it was legally uh, valid. However, it really had a very kind of retro look. If you look at it, it's actually it's really like from the 1930s. So I was a young person, barely 20, perhaps, traveling with the passport of my grandparents. Every time I have traveled to crossing the border, that created some kind of like confusions, like, well, who you are? Like, why do you have this passport? And even worse, every time I try to cross the border, the border guards look at the list of the names and see Liechtenstein, Luxembourg, Liechtenstein, Luxembourg. Where is Lithuania? There's a gap. So then I have to show my Soviet passport, but then they said, well, this is not your name on your passport, so who are you? Well, it's like long story short, what I have to like explain, et cetera, et cetera. The only sort of verifiable identity other than my face was my birthday and my place of birth, Vilnius. So when I settled in Vancouver, in Canada, I was admitted to Canada with the Soviet passports because Canadians did not recognize my Lithuanian passport. And it took me several years to regain my eye, even to prove for Canadians that this is who I am, really. So once I settled in Canada, in Vancouver, I started to go to graduate school studying geography. And I have a wonderful opportunity that truly changed perspective to the world, on one world, my perspective, teaching two very different courses. One course was designed for Japanese exchange students, and another course was designed for First Nations educational program students. Now, the Japanese students were very young, they were about 18, 19 years old, and in reality, they were not really necessarily interested in just sort of kind of like, you know, studying. They were much more interested in going and having fun, or skiing or something like that. Uh, and I was supposed to teach them the most boring, boring course about Canadian civic society and social system. I truly, truly, while I look at the curriculum, I had to teach about Canadian pension plans. Now imagine teaching 18 years old about Japanese student about Canadian pension plans. Doesn't go anywhere. So I have to like reorganize the entire course and I ask them what do they want to know? Well, they said we want to know how it is and what it is and how it is for a young person growing to grow up in Vancouver, in Canada. They put me on the spot, started to grill me, and I said, well, I can't answer that. And they look, why can you answer that? Because I said, I'm not really from Vancouver, I'm from Vilnius, from a different country. They, 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 like, they couldn't understand, so they said, why the Canadian university put in front of us to teach about Canada somebody who's like, was foreigner? <laughs> well, it didn't make a sense, you're right. So we tried to explore the city together, we tried to have fun together. Now, the First Nations, students were a completely different group. They were much more mature because they already have an educational program and experience teaching for about 10, 15 years. And there was a sort of not the same course, but a similar course because I was to teach about the city of Vancouver and history and civic politics, etc. And I knew that it's not going to go very well, in part because at some point, uh, one of the students said, why a white man, plus an immigrant, supposed to tell us about our city or teach? They were absolutely right. I have no right at all. What I had a right, of course, I had a right to listen to them. And they switched the tables. So they started to teaching me. Teaching me about dispossessions, losing lands, about their parents and grandparents' parents generations who were removed from the city or from the place of Vancouver into residential schools. And for them to regain the city, to remap the city, to understand that. So what I understood, in Vancouver, and looking back then to Vilnius, what I understood that being native means us not just establishing home, but also a possibility of losing home. And that, I think, it's also kind of important in understanding of biolocation. Now, the same year, my during summer break, I went to Los Angeles, where I met another very interesting group of people who call themselves Vilna Group. Vilna, it's a Yiddish name, Jewish Yiddish name of Vilnius. And the group consisted mostly of people of, in the 60s or 70s who left the city before the war. Some of them were Holocaust survivors. And they would gather together to talk all about Vilna. I was the only one from Vilnius. So, and I actually was different generation. So they asked, where are you from? I said, from Vilnius. They said, I am from Vilna. 
Then we met a common ground. They started asking me questions, what it is, how it is, et cetera, et cetera, to live in Vilnius. But also they started to lead me through the memories of the city. And I understood at that point how much little I know about the city. So this is basically what's my city, right? It's a very specific, like, Soviet map era. Very schematic, divided. We had a beautiful old town, but I don't remember anyone who can trace their family roots to that old town. We were all immigrants in many ways. Most of my family, friends, or whatever, were immigrant families. In a way, very much the same as I was immigrant in Vancouver. The Vilna group people, of course, grew up in a completely different. Even the map, in the way that they show, was different. It was more detailed, precise, and kind of like rich with all kinds of kind of like really what fascinated me. So the following year, I decided to go back to Vilnius. I think it was the first time after some period of time to rediscover Vilnius anew. And I decided to join to study Yiddish language at the local university. Now, in terms of learning Yiddish, it wasn't like really kind of very successful. I know a little bit, but not that much left. What I learned, actually, it's a very different, because part of the group of the learning Yiddish were also related to Vilna. There were students among them whose parents, grandparents left the city. And we were walking the streets together, me as a native, them as a native in exile, and trying to mesh our stories. And this has, to me, led to all kinds of rediscoveries through my entire, entire career. Every time I come back to Vilnius, I try to look with a different eye. I try to understand how the city must have been feel for somebody else. In the same way, I learned to recognize Vilnius in other places. Going to Shanghai, I see details, for example, and find, unsurprisingly, or some kind of like surprisingly, kind of like how some of the things from Vilnius resonate, even in places like Shanghai, not to mention places like New York, Paris, or something like that. In a way, there's always a possibility to learn about your own place when you go abroad, and vice versa, I would say, to learn about the globe in your own place, just to put a different perspective, just to talk to the people who have a different understanding or experience. Last year, I was doing, helping, actually, my friend to do a research on Jewish Vilna. Uh, and it took me to the KGB building, KGB archives in Vilnius. And he was doing some research, looking at some kind of archive material, and I was sitting a little bit bored. And I asked the receptionist, can you look and check if my KGB file? She looked at me very kind of ironic and said, do you think you have a file? I said, sure, why not, you know? So she entered my name, click, 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 you know. One second later, she looked even to me more suspiciously. Yes, you do have a file. <laughs> so, can I see it? Not today, tomorrow. Okay. So tomorrow, next day, I'm going back to KGB archives, and here's my file. It's, there it is. And there's a mystery of my missing eye, actually. Somebody in KGB, kind of misspell my name. And once KGB is doing something, of course, you can't, like, there's no recourse to call it back, right? So in a way, and it's my name is underlined. I don't know, maybe they thought that it is actually missing mine. When I look at that file, actually, it's even more interesting it occurred to me how much the file may be a stranger in the city, how much I was absorbed and my family was absorbed and whatever, and we treated as aliens in many ways in our own town. Now, the file was issued for me to go to the different countries, and Switzerland and the United States of America, and somebody, I suspect, even after me reaching Canada and selling Canada, put the name Canada, handwritten, by the way. So what is, for me, Vancouver and Vilnius? Vancouver, for me, as I mentioned, is really reaching into the world. Vilnius, to me, is reaching to the inside. And by putting them together, I believe in some sort of kind of establishing and Galilean sense of the place. Every place, look at it, as it is a solar system, where the city itself or the place itself, it stays fixed, but then you have many planets rotating around it. 
In Vilnius' case, you have Jewish, you have Polish, you have Lithuanian, you have Russian, you have German plants, and many others. In Vancouver, we have native First Nations planet, we have like first settlers planets, we have French Canadian plants, we have Chinese plants, etc., etc. So in the way, even in your own city, you can jump from one planet to another. You can explore it as a spatial exploration. And so this is my definition of being by local. Placing global matters within the intimate relationship between two different geographical locations. And I call it a Galilean model of local experiences. Spatial network connecting separate dots in history. And what I would like to finish, something in tone of recalling Vilnius history. The 17th century poet, Kazimierz Sorbievski, who was now more in his Latin name, Kazimierz Sorbievius, wrote about his experience traveling from Vilnius to Rome. Now, he traveled at the time during the 17th century, during the Thirty Years' War, the beginning of the Thirty Wars. That was the most bloodiest war before World War II. And he experienced really this kind of collapsing, if you want to call, of societies, collapsing of the world. And I have no doubt that while living in Rome, spending a few years in Rome, he was also exposed, perhaps, to the Galilean kind of thinking. Now, he was a Jesuit, so I don't know if he perhaps rejected that or not. But when he came back to Vilnius, he wrote a very wonderful poem, as I mentioned, in Latin. The poem is called A Departure from Things Humane. And it describes an ascent, not as dissimilar to the one that now astronauts kind of experience, and going into the heavens, going into the space. Here's the poem, here's the last tense of it. Am I deceived, or do I see the following winds on the wings mounting me? And now again, great kingdoms lie, whole nations perishing before mine eye. The earth, which always less has been, than was a globe. And now, just now, can spirit seen into its point that vanish. See? And that's it is our blue dot, it's vanishing. But we always can be exploring it in part through history, I believe that. In a way, going back, it is also an exploration of spatial exploration. So going back, recognizing your, your place in the world, but also recognizing that you inhabit somebody else's place. Walking somebody else's walk, if you want to call that, actually brings the notion of the globe back to home. Thank you very much.